I guess we'll get started. Um, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Craig Lundstrom. He's a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, I got interested in Craig's work because he's one of the only other people that's crazy enough to think that granite's been crystallized at 500 degrees C. Um, but um, Craig has a long career. Um, I'm going to make this statement um, that I think his career has kind of followed a liquid line of descent. Um, <laughs> and I'll explain that in a second. So he, he's from Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where I are from. So, you know, the Michigan, which I'm <laughs> I don't know how that happens. Um, got a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Colorado College in 1967. Um, and then because he's just a nice guy, went and worked in the Peace Corps in Kenya for two years, um, and then came back to geosciences, um, got a PhD from UC Santa Cruz in 1997, working with Clinton Williams and Jim Gill, um, went back to Colorado College where he to teach, and then then did a postdoc at Brown with Don Forsyth, and then went to BYUC um, where he is today. Uh, he's the recipient of the 2001 Clark Medal. He was given the Goldsmith Award, so it must have been a good conference. Um, but the reason I said the liquid line of descent thing is because he started working on uranium series disequilibrium and melting and mord, um, and he's kind of followed the liquid all the way now to what he's going to be talking about today, which is um, silicic magnetism. And I think he said earlier that he got interested in this going to a field school or field conference with uh, Alan Graves and Drew Palman in the Sierras, and I guess he saw the light with granites. And with that, I'll, I'll let Craig take it away. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It is, it's truly an honor to come speak at the birthplace of modern petrology. Um, everything I'm talking about here is, is essentially based on phase diagrams that were established at Carnegie. I want to say a couple things up front. First of all, um, I've entitled my talk as a, a, a question, and, and that's really, many of you probably don't think there, there's even a question about how we, we form granites anymore. It, we feel like there's an established way that um, we, we produce granites, and um, I'm hoping that that closed door of a solidus at 650 can be cracked open in a few of your minds, that there's something going on below that temperature that's important. Secondly, um, you'll see that a lot of this talk is based on, on Bowen's work, and I want to, I think it'll become clear, but I want to say up front that if you look back at his work, it's amazing what he did in the teens and 20s. Uh, and while I differ on some of the ultimate interpretations about the solidus, um, it is really the foundation, that thermodynamic equilibrium between minerals and melt controls igneous evolution that I'm basing my work on. All right, so I want to talk about magma differentiation, and broadly I'll say that this is the process of compositional evolution to change from what we know comes out of the mantle, basalt, to some sort of evolved igneous rock. And most of the igneous diversity that we have is actually based on processes in the crust. So I'm going to be talking about fairly low temperature processes. Now in the broadest perspective of the solar system, uh, Earth really is unique. It has this bimodal, oops, sorry, uh, bimodal crustal distribution. Of course, we have continents that are silicic and they, they float. And this has played a vital role in evolution of life, probably plate tectonics. Most people attribute the making of silicic rocks to the role of water, and I will say that it is the role of water interacting with silicates in the thermal boundary layer that is the crust. And like I said, we know that mineral melt equilibrium controls compositional differentiation, and that really rests on the work of Bowen. The question that I'm going to raise here is, while we typically think about differentiation being due to fractional crystallization or partial melting. And I, like all of you, have, have modeled igneous data sets through those mass balance models. 
The question really is the process. Do we actually mechanically separate crystals and melt to cause that compositional differentiation dictated by thermodynamic equilibrium? Or can there be a combined physical chemical process whereby we can shorten the length scales and use basically diffusion in a thermal gradient to cause the differentiation that we see? So some of the motivations come from the fact that we have a lot of new observations that really play into the interpretations that we have for making silicic rocks. The first one is that we basically have improved techniques of seismology and geophysics, and yet we fail to see anything in the way of a large tank of magma, the scale of these plutons that we see that make up the continental crust. So um, basically, we're lacking big tanks of, of melt. This was prominent when I was a grad student working on mid-ocean ridges. We went from the big onion rind model where the magma chamber was the scale of the gabbro body, three kilometers in scale, to the fact that we have a, now we view it as a melt lens where we might have a 100 meter thick layer of melt and a mush zone below it. Likewise, in the continents, we have tomography underneath stratovolcanoes, and we basically have relatively low, small P wave velocity reductions, which amount to less than 10% melt in many cases. Also, from the petrology standpoint, and this was really one of the works that, that, that got me interested in the granite problem, was reviewing this, a proposal <laughs> where the North Carolina group had started to date the Tuolumne intrusive series in the Sierra Nevada. And what they found was that basically there's a gradation of ages from 95 million years on the outsides of this pluton to 85 million years on the inside of the pluton and this goes against the basic model of how we had been thinking about granite pluton formation for many years, that you have this slow fractional crystallization process to create evolved liquids inward. That's because that liquid would cool at, in hundreds of thousands of years in the slowest possible time scale. So we really need to rethink how these plutons are made. And this has led to the general community feeling that there's some sort of incremental dike sill emplacement. But if you look at the Tuolumne, the compositional zoning is quite remarkable, actually. It has this rather smooth looking compositional change towards the inside. And you have to think about dike emplacement being something that would produce mafic liquids on the outside that would somehow move inside with time. It doesn't really make sense. Finally, the newest geochronology data would say that the time scales of cooling the granitic rocks from above 700 degrees to below 500 is actually quite quick, right? Multiple chronometers using different closure temperatures, it cools quite quickly. The issue then that I want to point out is that when you start looking at the geochronology using biotite argon dates, you get another eight to 10 million years. So the picture here is that these plutons cool below 500 relatively quickly, but sit and a simmering state between 300 and 500 for significant times. Another new observation, relatively new observation, is the use of these metal stable isotope systems. Now, before the 90s, we assumed that stable isotopes and magmatic systems were going to be quite small and unobservable because equilibrium fractionation scales with 1 over t squared. Uh, 
largely driven by multi-collector ICPMS. We can now measure a large variety of stable isotope systems. And remarkably, we see systematic variations with differentiation index. And I'll talk a little bit about iron and also silicon isotopes. And I'll say up front that the cause of these fractionations and variations is highly debated. What I'm going to tell you is different than what a lot of people would say. And I just say that this is a piece of information that we need to take into consideration as we look at the process. And then recently, there's another paper which paints the connection between silicic plutons and silicic volcanics in a really interesting light. And this paper came out in Science this summer where they were looking at the behavior of lithium concentration profiles in zircons from silicic volcanics from the Taupo volcanic zone. And these zircon crystals have ages of 50 to 100,000 years. And yet, they have lithium profiles, which, because lithium is such a fast diffuser, would diffusively smooth out quite rapidly. And you can see right here that if we were at magmatic temperatures, where we think they're erupted, 750 degrees, <laughs> those profiles would be erased in one to 10 years, right? And it really requires that these crystals are sitting at relatively low temperatures for these 50,000 year time scales just prior to the eruption. And then they're heated and erupted. And I'd also like to point out that, you know, we have abundant evidence from granites for two feldspar thermometry that indicate temperatures below 500. Mike and people here have been working on the fact that titanium and quartz thermometry of granites may indicate temperatures that are also in the 500 degree range. So there are pieces of evidence for the processes that I'm going to talk about at low temperature. And the question is, really, what is the relevant part of this process that is occurring to end up making the granites that we see? And I'm going to focus this talk on the intrusive story, because we're basically trying to make baby steps, <laughs> trying to get people to understand that this is a possible process going on in intrusive rocks. But I was an editor on this elements issue where we were discussing the long list of contradictions between time scales, geophysics, all sorts of things related to the volcanic plutonic connection. And ultimately, this is a really important part of the problem is if we have granites that are long and slow and cool, <laughs> how do we have ignimbrites that are aphiric and higher temperature? All right. So Bowen's work, Bowen basically changed the whole question of the granite controversy from one of our granites metamorphic, metasomatic, versus are they igneous? And the way they did this was the publication of the book, The Origin of Granite in Light of Experiments in the Elbite Orthoclase Quartz Water System. And so to briefly, probably don't need to explain this to this crowd, but here we are. We have a phase diagram, which is silica component, elbite component, orthoclase component. The phase diagram shows that we have the fields of quartz and alkali feldspar with a cotectic valley down the center. And that cotectic valley has a low point, which we refer to as the minimum melting point. And they establish that it's relatively close to a third, third, third mixture of these components. And that's what established the granite solidus at 650 degrees. And the connection to rhyolites and, and granites on Earth comes from the fact that they assessed all the compositions of rocks on Earth that had greater than 80% quartz and feldspar. And they plotted them on a contour diagram. And sure enough, you can see it forms a bullseye, which is centered right over the minimum melt point. Aha. So 
granites and rhyolites are igneous rocks. That was solving that problem. And they are melts that are coming from equilibrium with quartz and feldspar at this minimum melting point. Now, this is a book, and they spent literally 10 pages trying to prove to everyone that there was no peralkaline component in granites. So you do the normative mineralogy of granite compositions, and there's very few that have any peralkaline compositions. Uh, volcanic rocks, actually, it's about 15 or 20 percent. So it's, there is a little bit of difference there. That's interesting. So I'll come back to why that's important. So my other point of looking at this is here we have this rock. The, the granodiorites are getting close to the minimum melt point. That, that's making up the majority of the, the continental crust. And if we use our standard mechanical separations, that is taking melt away from a crystal residue, what it requires is, is that we are separating from a quartz-bearing residue. And I have two things to say about that. Well, it says that the lower crust has to be quartz-saturated if we're, we're, we're bringing them up to make these granites in the upper crust. That seems kind of strange. And second, it doesn't really give us the answer of how we went from basalt to a quartz-saturated residue. So both of those points, I would like to come up with a, another way that we can think about making granite that does relate to the thermodynamic mineral melt equilibrium. So within the Tuttle and Bowen book, they also provided experiments in the silica potassia alumina system. And what they showed was that this line here, this is Petrogenes residua. That is the plane that would contain feldspars and quartz. And as you go away towards peralkaline compositions, you have coexisting quartz and case bar with the isotherms going below 400 degrees. So they had experiments that they showed a water-rich melt with potassium and silica coexisting with quartz and orthoclase at less than 400 degrees. At that time, they knew there was a lot of water in there, but they couldn't measure it. They did all these experiments as water saturated. And the point that I'm going to lead to is, is separating melt from this minimum melt point on the last diagram the only way that we can form granite? And of course, if I'm going to ask that, there's another answer. And this was really a dirty, complicated experiment that um, really changed the course of my, my research and directions of, of thinking about this. So what had been done in the past, Bruce, Bruce Watson had done some interesting thermal gradient experiments of granite interacting with basalt, saw some things. Chip Lesher and Dave Walker did a number of experiments looking at the effects of, of temperature gradients. And mostly people think about those Saray experiments, which are uh, above liquidus experiments. Well, they also did experiments where you had put minerals and melt together in a thermal gradient, in other words, below liquidus temperatures. And what they showed is that if you have a dry morb, you get this systematic layering of minerals. But nobody had done these experiments where you had water added in the system. And so what we did was we used AGV1, which is a USGS andesite powder, and we added 4 weight percent water to a capsule, which was 2 centimeters long, had a thermal gradient, which was 950 degrees at one end, 350 degrees at another end, and we let it sit for over two months. And we quenched it. And the result of that experiment is pretty shocking when you open up and polish the capsule. Here's the two centimeter long capsule. The top hot end, you can see, is a black shiny glass. If you look in the middle section, you can see that there's a nice layering of minerals, a 20% mag magnetite layer, amphibole plus plaid gabbro area, and the bottom of the capsule is this light-colored material, which turns out to be a microcrystalline granite. Quartz and two feldspars 
73% silica, 11% alumina, it, it's a dead ringer for a granite. There's very little porosity after the quench in this melt. At most, at most it would be 5% some sort of interstitial fluid melt sort of thing. But honestly, there's plucking that goes on. I'd say that it's more like 2%. If you do the compositional analysis on this, this, this granite after polishing it with oil, you get a metal luminous granite composition. And if you try to put, as I'll talk about, these uh, you know, 2% metal lum sorry, 2% of this peralkaline melt that I'm going to talk about in there, you can't see it. Okay? But basically, you can have this differentiation process that goes on via diffusion that saturates minerals at different temperatures, causes components to move in different directions, and result in bulk compositions down the experiment that look much like a liquid line of descent. So the question is, what happened and why? So it was a self-differentiation process that gets called this awkward name thermal migration. We can try to actually model it. There's a program named Iridium by Alan Boudreau, which links uh, a melt space calculator with nodal variations that you can put in a temperature gradient. You can cause diffusion calculations to work. And essentially, if you take the andesite starting material with water and you let that calculation run for 50 days, you can see that it does a decent job of reproducing what you see. You get a 100% melt area, you get a melt plus magnetite area, you get a melt plus magnetite plus a mafic phase. Of course, all of these melt space calculations have to stop at 600 degrees-ish, right? And this, essentially, I had to end this one at 700 because the melt fraction gets too low for the calculation to work. So if there's a plea out there, it would be that we need to basically develop these melt systems that can, can actually go down to talk about some of the things that I'll talk about here. Steve. Right, so, so gravity, so the, in a piston cylinder, your hot spot is above, and you, yes, you would say, oh, it's, it, it could be a settling process that's going on in that experiment. The only problem is, is that when we do the isotope analysis that's in that experiment, you'll see the very regular isotope variations that go on in there, which basically rule out a, a settling process. But good question. All right, so nothing should have happened when we take our normal view of a 650 degree solidus. What should have happened is that at 650, we basically produce a a dry, powdery stuff at the lower part of the experiment. And obviously, that's not what happens. So to state where I'm going, essentially, the solubility of quartz is very temperature dependent. We can stabilize these low temperature, water-rich peralkaline melts throughout the whole capsule. And we basically have a rapid transport process that goes on throughout the capsule, which allows the components to move to the locations to saturate in phases which are thermodynamically um, favored at that temperature. And so the way we should really look at the phase diagram is this, where we have Petrogenes residua as a plane here. And there's a field of quartz, and there's a field of feldspar, and there's a cotectic plane that heads down towards the sodium, potassium, silica side of the plane. And the question is, how low can you go here? 300 degrees? So last year, I published a paper that was partially entitled, Can Granite Form Without Rhyolitic Melt? So everything that we do is based on the idea that we form rhyolite composition melts at 650 degrees, and we emplace them, and those, those become granites. And what I'm saying and, sh and seeing in an experiment is that if we can impose a thermal gradient, um, we can actually have a 
short length scale differentiation process that can produce the silicic materials that we see. So in terms of experiments in this paper, they were relatively short and brief. The first type was basically taking quartz and a sodium silicate, uh, an alkali silicate glass with water and putting them in a capsule. These are cold seal experiments at half a kilobar to a kilobar pressure and um, letting it run for a week or two. And the result of this, of placing this glass made of the feldspar components is that we end up making two feldspars, quartz and melt, at 330 degrees. Very difficult to see and work with the melt in that experiment. So second set of experiments were taking um, pre-fractured quartz grains, also with the sodium potassium silicate, and then um, using natural case bar and albite crystals, forcing the, this water per alkaline melt material to react with the crystals, and then we, we trap the materials in inclusions that form in the quartz. And this allows us to measure the water content through confocal Raman techniques. And the inclusions looked like this, about 50 to 70 microns in size. You can see a vapor bubble. Well, we take that on a heating stage, and we can prove that that homogenizes into a single phase at the temperature of the experiment. So that means that we actually were water undersaturated. We measure the water content. It's a tricky measurement through the crystal and standardization and all. But we can say that that was greater than 40% water in that material. We also measure the anhydrous melt composition. And it's on order of 35% alkalis, 60% silica and very low alumina, which is consistent with us moving away from Petrogenes residua towards that um, uh, plane of alkalis and silica. So this summer I've been working on even simpler experiments where I'm basically working in the system sodium, aluminum, silica, water. And Shire and Bowen did all the work in the dry system, which is shown here, we have uh, silica minerals, a field of quartz right here. Here's the field of albite, and then a big field of sodium disilicate. Now, in the dry potassium silica alumina system, we get a potassium silicate crystalline phase, which disappears when you add water. Nobody had done the experiments with uh, water and the saturated in, in quartz and albite over a range in temperatures. So that's what I've done here. At one kilobar, we're basically starting with a mixture of quartz albite and a hydrosodium disilicate with over 30% water in it. And we run experiments at 75 degree intervals from the albite quartz eutectic down to 330 degrees. Now, one of the uh, happy findings of the first set of experiments was that we can actually quench these things to a glass. That makes life a lot easier. So you can see that I have a glass here with crystals present. As I'll show you, um, we do have vapor bubbles that form in the experiment, but only at temperatures above 600 degrees. And right now, I calculate the mass fraction based on the, the melt, measured melt composition and the bulk composition that's added to the, and then I calculate the water contents based on that. And here are the results of those experiments. So this is starting with the eutectic. Uh, our values for the eutectic composition are slightly different, and I'll say that there's probably some slop in the major element characterization of these glasses. Um, they are very water-rich, very alkali-rich glasses, which suffer the most from difficulties in analysis. Nevertheless, you can see that there is a very straightforward increase in the alkali sodium content. The silica contents actually 
decrease as we go down temperature. Essentially, what's going on is they are heading right towards the sodium disilicate corner. And finally, the aluminum content goes down consistently to essentially zero aluminum, very small amounts of aluminum that we can see in the temperature, that's the 330 degree temperature. So there's a regular change in composition to form something like 30% sodium, 67% silica, hardly any alumina, and water contents that are not saturated at 28 weight percent um, at 330 degrees. And one of the things that's really interesting is, as opposed to the dry system, which shows the quartz albite essentially marching perpendicular to the Petrogenes residual plane, what happens is it goes down to about 600 degrees, and then it starts heading over towards the uh, disilicate, sodium disilicate field or um, compositional area. And what that's telling you about is that this is the increase in the the temperature dependence of quartz solubility. So it's a mechanism of dumping out quartz as these fluids go down temperature. So a quick going back to some of the other issues that we see in the, the uh, volcanic plutonic connections. To me, there's a mismatch between what we see seismologically and the current electrical conductivity measurement. And for instance, a really good example is this study by Hill and all, which looks at the conductivity of the upper crust between St. Helens, uh, Mount Rainier, and Mount Adams. And what they found are these incredibly high electrical conductivities in the areas between the stratovolcanoes. Now, if you think about it, this is just the perfect area. You've got three conduits feeding hot magmas up to the stratovolcanoes. There's going to be a warm temperature, perhaps silicic mush in between, and we could be pr providing a, a great place to have this 30% sodium water solution that's giving you the electrical conductivity. Obviously, another really important geophysical technique is seeing the deformation through INSAR and other techniques on these volcanoes. And the question is, what is that? So to me, if you have this interstitial melt that's existing in these magmatic systems, and you can actually change the temperature of the system slightly, you can imagine that you can go from holding 50% water in this interstitial fluid at low temperature to making it go to something that can only hold 8% water, right? And so there's a, an easy way of creating a vapor phase that pulses with the arrival of a small amount of heat. So another part of the story is that within these thermal gradient experiments that we did, we found what others had previously found, and that is there's a very large isotopic fractionation that goes on in the temperature gradient. So in a paper that Ilya Bindman first authored on the same experiment, Ilya pulled out milligram-sized samples of the, of the experiment. Milligram size are effectively bulk compositions, right? You're mostly analyzing the crystalline solid. And you can see a very regular 24 per mil change in the oxygen isotopes. The hydrogen isotopes vary by 14% in a similar manner, and the lithium isotopes by 19 per mil. So what this speaks to is that there is a fluid phase, and in the case of oxygen and hydrogen isotopes, it's molecular water that is simply moving its way through all those grains and exchanging with the solid material and imprinting this thermal diffusion isotopic signature on them. We also measured the silicon isotopes at the bottom of that capsule. It's 0.8 per mil heavier than the starting material, so we have probably a 1.6 per mil range in silicon isotopes. So in a collaboration with Dan Lax and 
Jim Van Orman, who do molecular dynamics calculations, we dug further into this issue of why it is that you get a isotopic fractionation in these temperature gradients. And this is Dan's work, and I, I think it's perhaps one of the most important insights that we can have to this whole problem. What you can see are plotted data for experiments on silicon, oxygen, magnesium isotopes in these experiments, and then the black solids are the molecular dynamics calculations. And what's being plotted is the change in the delta value scaled by the, the percent mass difference versus the uh, homogenized temperature, if you will, the, the, the temperature difference. So in other words, OK, so first of all, the molecular dynamics calculations have temperature gradients that are 10 to the seventh times bigger than this enormous temperature gradient that I have in my experiments. And yet, when you treat the system this way, they still all behave the same. In other words, the process doesn't reflect the gradient itself. If you put any sort of fluid in an imposed temperature gradient and give it enough time, you have an isotopic sorting process that goes on. And so I'll give credit to Dan for the following Midwest-based analogy. And that is the football analogy, OK? So you've got hard spheres that have nothing to do with their chemistry, for the most part. Silicon is a little different here, that are essentially vibrating back and forth in Brownian motion. And one's a heavier isotope, and one's a lighter isotope. The lighter isotope happens to be the small Michigan football player. Now, I don't know if there's any Michigan people here, but yeah. <laughs> so essentially, if you have the heavier isotope sitting at the hot end of the temperature gradient, it has the momentum, that's the cold end, right? The, the, the heavier isotope now has the momentum to basically do an exchange reaction with the lighter isotope. And what happens is you can exchange them, and you get the heavier isotope basically falling on the low temperature end of the experiment. So all of the thermal diffusion isotopic fractionation that we see is really just isotopic sorting due to this effect. OK, so that is a segue into, the, of course, the big problem. You know, Bowen faced the crucible to Pluton issues, right? And it's remarkable how he changed the community to realize that thermodynamic equilibrium through his experiments controlled the generation of, of all igneous evolution, right? He also, in 1923, did experiments where he measured the chemical diffusion rates of elements and showed that they were much lower than heat diffusion, and he made the very correct argument that if you inject a magma, it's going to lose heat before it could do anything chemically, and therefore temperature gradients have nothing to do with igneous processes. Well, the quenching rates in the experiments, uh, in the piston cylinder, hundreds of degrees in a second. For the experiments? I, I don't think so. Um, we can talk afterwards, but I, I think that even the cold seal experiments are quenching fast enough to give us a glass and not have a quench material. OK? So that argument holds if you have a closed system. But we've now realized that we have an incremental process, and it's very easy, actually, to basically decouple the heat issue from the mass diffusion issue. Okay, So if we take a pluton, and especially if we're making it top down with sills coming in from below, we're basically providing an imposed thermal gradient that acts locally on the, the mass diffusion that's going on. And Watson and Wark showed that in these really depolymerized fluids, <laughs> right, we can have extremely rapid diffusion rates. So the diffusivity of silica 
in a fluid at 1,000 degrees is essentially the same as heat diffusion. Right? Now, we're not talking about temperatures that high. Nevertheless, you can see that a uh, depolymerized, fluid-rich thing can diffuse much faster than what we talk about with a silicic melt. So the question is, how do you make diffusive link scales similar to the link scale that you want to differentiate a magma body? All right, so we, I proposed a model that was called thermal migration zone refining. And basically what it says is you have a stratovolcano, you plug it up, right, and you start to form a sill complex which builds down with time. And as long as you are adding material downward in terms of sills at a rate that's slow enough that the diffusion can keep up, then you can... Uh, essentially do a mini thermal migration experiment locally and move this down with time. And the problem all boils down to keeping the Peclet number around one. And so if you have a one millimeter per year sill complex building downward, you, do, you, can, you can diffusively equilibrate that material over about 300 millimeter length scale if you have this relatively high diffusivity. And so we have a, a, a model of iridium where we can actually do this process. And the key point to make here is that what goes on is that each time you bring in a new sill, your, basically your gabbroic material, which has your high temperature components, is essentially growing downward or, or moving downward with time, right? And so if you think about it, we have this problem of these very large convergent margin plutons with nothing in the way of a mafic residue or root. Here we can basically concentrate it into a relatively small amount of material um, and perhaps delaminate it and do all sorts of things to, to get rid of it. So I'm going to take you on two excursions for field work that I try to apply these ideas of low temperature melt formation to making of silicic rocks in the earth. The first is um, Cordillera Paine, uh, Torres del Paine National Park in Chile. It's a beautiful granitic pluton, 12 million years old. It's got about a one and a half kilometer thickness of towers of, of pretty homogeneous granite underlain by the Pine Mafic complex, which is a series of diorite and gabbro sills. The Swiss had completed a project and shown that, indeed, it actually dates oldest on top, younging downward with time. So it's consistent. It's got this Mafic complex that we can look at in detail. And this was a study by my student, Norbert Gaios, which came out last year. Looking inside this pluton, the, the glaciers have carved away the inside. And maybe a little hard to see here, but you can see that there's a dark rock that comes up and forms an incredibly horizontal plane between the gabbros and the overlying granites. And then it comes down on the side. If you were to draw what it looks like, here's the country rock. And basically, the granite drapes around the sides. And these corners here are almost perfect, sort of 130 degree angles that, to me, don't look like injection of basalt into the granite. They look like some sort of isotherm, although we need to work more on how that would be. But again, remember, we're trying to think about this from the standpoint of isotopes and whether we can see a signature. And the hypothesis would be that we'd get heavy signatures on the outside of the granite, and the granite that's going to be closer to the mafic complex is going to be lighter. So here are the data. The gabbros and diorites are indeed light, like just like all mafic rocks on Earth are. But when you actually break out the marginal granites, 
from the interior granites, we get a significant difference in the average iron isotope composition, with the outside granites being heavier than the interior granites. So at least that's consistent with the, the basic idea. We also did a limited amount of silicon isotopes. And the silicon isotopes for the igneous rocks basically are, are shown here with the, some other people's data also. And the thing that I'd like to point out is that this has been seen since the 1980s, but it's the development of better mass spectrometry, which is hammered down these error bars, we can see there's a very regular increase to heavy isotopes with differentiation. And essentially what it's doing is an easy, simple way to explain these data are simply the addition of heavy silicon by a precipitation of silicon in these low temperature fluids that I'm talking about, right, with an average isotope composition of around zero. All right, so in terms of uh, another place to look for temperature gradients, mid-ocean ridges become a, a great place where we have no arguments about open system processes. So this is the Trudos ophiolite. And if we look in at the Trudos ophiolite, we have the sheet of dike complex. The olive green are the gabbros. And as you notice, on the outside of this domal structure that exposes the, the, the gabbros, we have all these brown layers, which happen to be plagiogranites. So there's silicic material with up to 75% silica forming in pods at the sheeted dike gabbro interface of the ocean crust. And so the hypothesis here was, well, maybe we can go to a place where we can go from a, a mapping material that's the upper gabbros out to the sheet of dikes and collect materials that are plagiogranites and examine them for their isotopic composition. And this could happen a number of different ways, but you can think of the, the melt lens sitting here, usually throwing basalt up through the sheet of dikes and placing the sheet of dikes, but there's obviously got to be a country rock material of those sheet of dike material that is essentially rafting off axis at the plate spreading rate. In other words, it's a crystalline mush material that is sitting there moving off axis at millimeter per year rates, being exposed to a continuous flow of heat from that melt lens. And what I'm positing is that it's that sitting there for tens of thousands to million years that you can basically interact along that temperature gradient and form these plagiogranite pods. So if you look at them in whole rock compositions, you can see the silica content picks up going out to the sheeted dikes this is our gabbro starting material. There is a mafic pod in there, okay? And I'll show you some of the complexity that goes on in, in these rocks. But there are regular behaviors and things like strontium. Here are the isotopic results. You can see a very clear increase in the iron isotopes as you go out away from the gabbros towards the sheeted dikes. That's consistent with what we expected to see by a thermal diffusion. You can see that the, the mafic pod remains down here. So whatever's going on there, it's not reacting and equilibrating and getting that heavy signature. Silicon isotopes do the same thing. We have a high silica sample here, and sure enough, it has a lighter silicon isotope signature. So I think the isotope data are at least consistent with what I'm saying. Like I said, there, there are many competing explanations for what's going on to form the isotopic signature. But put in the context of what I'm talking about from the, the experimental side of things, I think that, that what we're seeing is at least consistent with this story. So digging into this just a little bit farther hopefully gives you some ideas to talk about this afternoon. I want to say, are the plagiogranites really the end of this process? 
you look at the ocean crust section, essentially most of the upper crust has been green schist metamorphosed. The plagiogranites are made of albite, quartz, actinolite, some chloride epidote, titanite. Start looking at the, the sheeted dikes that have been green schist altered. Are, they're basically the same minerals, mostly just different proportions. And you start to look at the amphibole compositions. And you can you tell me that these are igneous amphiboles and these are metamorphic amphiboles down here? There's actually a, just a full continuum of mineral, of, of amphibole compositions from aluminous horn blends down to actinolites. And here's an example. So here are the plagiogranites with these brecciated chunks of mafic material. You zoom in here, this is only two millimeters, and you do x-ray maps here. It's the same assemblage. The plagioclase basically is getting slightly less anorthitic. The amphiboles here and here start out with the same silica contents, but the magnesium number's higher here. And we're just stepping out to actinolite amphiboles on the scale of millimeter length scales. The strontium isotopes in Trudos and ocean drill cores shows this. They're pervasively exchanged with seawater strontium. So the water for this plagiogranite formation is the slow trickle of ocean water into the sides of that magmatic system. It heats up forms this sodium silicate melt, and it moves up, and it causes this sort of exchange process. And I'll provoke you, because most people would say that this oxygen isotope profile that we look at in the ocean crust is one of equilibrium fractionation as a function of temperature changes. But it looks remarkably like a thermal diffusion profile like in that experiment, right? In other words, you have this hot water rich melt that is sitting there and we have the same sort of thermal diffusion process acting on the whole entire ocean crust. So this is, could be potentially important for a number of aspects of, of a bigger view of geology. Escala proposed that there was a spilitization reaction. That's what's causing the green schist formation in the basalts. And he used sodium carbonate seawater. Well, what I'm saying is, let's rewrite this equation. So we take a typical basalt gabbro. We add sodium silicate and water. And we can form those same reaction products, epidote, chloride, actinolite, albite, quartz. And importantly, we get a lot of free calcium that's produced by this. So just a quick, dirty, cook and look experiment. I took diopside glass and plagioclase with sodium silicate, put it into a cold seal for a kilo, at a kilobar for two weeks. And what you can see is that, uh, this is a crappy thing, <laughs> sorry. The, the um, shards of what were diopside glass still look like shards of diopside glass, except for now they're all actinolites. And what has happened is that 25% calcium that was in that diopside glass is now being shed into the melt of the system. So in other words, these low temperature reactions are driving the freeing of the calcium from the original igneous rock, let's call it, and freeing it up for potentially a very important process on this Earth. Two thirds of the calcium in the ocean crust is being released during this sort of process, and essentially forming calcite. Some of it's forming titanate and other calcium-based minerals. But you have a lot to form calcite. This is a tremendous scrubber system for CO2 from the ocean. right? If you look at it, the riverine calcium flux is something like this per year. By calculating the upper half of the ocean crust, with 2 thirds of it being free, you get a factor of 40 greater amount of calcium produced. This also could be a way that we can explain some of the heat flow problems in the ocean crust, because the hydrothermal systems, the smokers, only account for 20% of the heat. And finally, this 
is, to me, a potentially ripe environment for life. Basically, we're talking about diffuse warm water moving up through reduced basalts, right? And metal sulfides have been shown to have really high solubilities in this stuff. So this could be a reason why we think that molybdenum is actually a pretty important uh, enzyme forming metal for early life. So I'll end there. Phase equilibria show that you can have this water-rich melt existing down to temperatures as low as 330 degrees. If you have a slow incremental emplacement process, and this is the big if, where the diffusivities can keep up with the rate that you bring the new magma in, then you can differentiate all the way down to these sorts of silicic materials. And I'd just say that Right now, we have some metal stable isotope data that are at least consistent with the ideas that I'm proposing in this model. So, thank you. It has always intrigued me to see these, the, the, the dome and keel structures, right? Um, I want to talk to Jesse about the Iceland sort of paper. I'm really interested in Iceland because it has, there's the uh, Osterhorn complex on the eastern side, which has a lot of these sort of textures. So yes, I, th I think on a small scale, you can create pods. The question is, how, how big a scale can you, can, you, can you make this stuff? And I'm not really willing to go out in the room. I'm, I'm most interested in identifying process, <laughs> trying to get other people to feel that this is an important process to make silicic materials. And then we can go to figuring out how it all happens in the big picture. Yeah. Well, absolutely. It, it is. Ma some magmas are obviously being emplaced at 1,000 degrees C, and there is an evolution process down. I'm somewhat happy to see that, you know, you could, you could, you know, to say, yeah, we form some rhyolite liquids and they get in place sometimes, but and, and then this process acts at a lower, at a lower temperature. But I, I, I honestly don't see a reason why. The basic arguments that water is incredibly important for so many processes, including the movement of heat. And my overall view is that when you have water rich magmas that come in and make silk complexes, that water can carry heat out of there incredibly fast. And that's why we see those, those cooling in the granitic systems down below 500 degrees very fast. And that we're really seeing this. You know, in the scale of those plutons, we're seeing literally millions of years of underplating going on and this diffuse water rich stuff flowing up through them for that time. Okay? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure I followed the stable isotope argument, but just a question though. Why don't you see all of granite have very high sort of deltoids and melt values like you saw in your experiment, or, or at least very little? You Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so what I would say, uh, I've thought about this a lot, but but the, you know, we have the confounding problem that water's everywhere. There's meteoric water with very different water signatures, and that's getting into the system too. And so when we're looking at oxygen isotopes, we're looking at a mishmash of of sources that are contributing to. So then I'm not sure I understand the, the question completely. But one thing, so, so um, the oxygen isotopes in continental plutons are a mess. 
okay? Y y you can see they're all over the place, right? The oxygen isotope profile in the oceanic crust is actually, relatively speaking, cleaner, right? And that's why I, you, 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 I would suggest that, that what we're seeing is that thermal diffusion signature. Why would they be cleaner in the ocean setting? Well, it's got a very homogeneous water that's coming in from outside that, that's playing around, that, that, that the effects of the meteoric water and other waters in the upper crust in the continents are what causes our problem with oxygen there. Does that make sense? Yeah, right. So the question to me is when and how does that form? Okay? And everything that we're seeing observationally seems to show that the you know the, the silicic stuff does form quite rapidly, right? And also, you know, now we have these databases of ten thousand analyses, and you do an analysis of of strontium composition of granites and rhyolite. They're identical, okay? So the models, I, I do have a problem, I, I do not see how rhyolites are being extracted from granitoid residues with, with that ten thousands of analysis that point, that, that tell us that that's not true. So to me, I'm arguing that the granites are forming, you know, at these low temperatures. The question is, how do you do it, okay? The biggest problem is the latent heat issue. You don't, you, you don't just melt this stuff, right? So there is a paper that we're working on. You know, it's one step at a time sort of thing. But I have an idea that if we have a granitic mush system that has you know, a few percent of this stuff interstitially, and it has this rather odd behavior of retrograde in immiscibility. In other words, you heat it up, it forms the vapor phase, right? Imagine we have a, a large vat of mush with a lot. You, you heat up the inside. You can imagine a sort of positive feedback process where that water turns into a vapor phase, brings enough heat to the next layer, causes it to go immiscible. You basically can produce a lot of vapor phase water-rich material that goes up. And we've done the experiments with sodium silicate and granite. And at 600 degrees, I can melt 25 milligrams of granite in 25 milligrams of water plus sodium silicate. So it's pretty good ratio, right? You, you can basically dissolve. It's not necessarily melting, but it's dissolving that granite crystalline material and make some sort of aetheric material. That, that, that would be where I would, that's where I'm headed. Yeah. 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 Well, um, it's a question of how dry. You know, on Earth, there's no such thing as <laughs> as dry, dry, right? And they, the estimates are that in what gets erupted, it's on order of two eight percent water. That doesn't mean that you know we couldn't have. No, no, but what it gets erupted, we know it never has that amount, right? And we, we have a hard time actually measuring how much water was there at the, the time when it was erupted, too. But, but in other words, it's perfectly plausible to have this interstitial stuff going on at Yellowstone with you know, high amounts of water. And then why does it give you such high eruption temperatures? I mean, that's consistent with it forcing water out of the system and giving you that 2 weight percent nominal in the rhyolite. But there's a lot that we don't know that goes on in that sort of eruption process. Okay? In those, those uh, experiments that I just did? Yeah. So um, Right now, I, I, you know, I seal them in noble metal capsules and make sure that the weight maintains its weight. I know how much of the starting material I put in that capsule, and I calculate 
the modal amounts of the melt and those two crystal assemblages to give me the, the fraction of melt in the experiment, and I'm simply um, normalizing the composition of water based on it all going into the melt. Does that make sense? So there's um, uh, the water saturated ones that have relatively small bubbles, they, they actually may not have eight weight percent water in that glass. I'd like to try to measure them, but as Mike and I talked about, um, that little chip that I showed you, which is beautiful glass with crystals, I went back, what, a month later, and it was just this ugly whitish powder. So this stuff just devitrifies and goes to nothing in no time. So um, I do the experiment, I mount the capsule unopened in cold epoxy, I polish it the next morning to expose it, and I get it on and make the major element measurements right away. But I don't know what they're going to, you know, <laughs> how long they'll last. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> If you heard, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And it, 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 it and I, 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 let me say, first of all, I said it's consistent, so that's not ruling out the other ones. And I can see that, you know, these low temperatures. The equilibrium effect could be important also, and there could be a combination of things. But, but the one thing that I will say, <laughs> because I'll give you kudos for doing the, the, the magnetite olivine iron fractionation. It backs up what we know from theory of isotopic fractionation and the, the Mossbauer sort of stuff, that iron three rich phases should be heavy. All of these calc alkaline systems that we look at, magnetite accounts for roughly 70, 75% of the iron budget being removed. Magnetite being taken out should drive the silicic residue, the silicic melt that we're talking about, to a light composition, which is opposite of what we see. 70%. So, so then, it, then it requires that pyroxene, or ampable, is doing three times the business of magnetite in the opposite direction. That's that's so to me, I'm I'm obviously advocating some other processes than fractional crystallization. Okay, so maybe I have an agenda, but to me, it is a square peg in a round hole to try to call on fractional crystallization to explain what we see in the iron isotope data. There. I'm a, I, I could be a big fan of losing a f light fluid away from the assemblage. I, I believe that that's possible. I don't, now, now, now look at the vanadium isotope data. They, they get heavy. And if you take magnetite out, you know the vanadium fractionation factor is going to be the same way as iron. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm I first came at it from the standpoint of the isotope geochemist of, look, this is the, we, th we think there's a temperature gradient effect and I see this, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have been so pounded by the community that I am much more interested in doing the experiments to understand the properties of the melt crystal equilibrium at low temperature. It, it's. <laughs> I feel like the isotope battle is just is um, talking to people who aren't really interested in, in knowing about the alternative. They're, they're the most of the isotope people are thinking about it from the traditional fractional crystallization sort of thread, and and um, 
the role of temperature gradients is not something that they want to think about. 